Well, thank you very much, Philip, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to, to launch the handbook, which was actually published in August, but this is the, the first official launch event for it. Uh, I'm sorry that my co-editors, Richard Hemming and Barry Potter, are not here, but they, they were unfortunately not able to come from the States, but, but I'm very happy to be here myself. I just want to say a few words about the handbook. Uh, and it, it was a lot of work. It took three years to, to produce. Uh, the original idea we had was actually to produce an encyclopedia of public financial management, uh, but this pro proved to be an even more daunting uh, challenge than, than producing a handbook, so we eventually decided on the handbook idea. But it is meant to be uh, really a comprehensive treatment uh, of public financial management. One of the reasons we, we decided to do it was because there's been no s similar reference book for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, in the late 90s and around 2000, there were a number of books produced by the IMF, the World Bank. I edited one with Daniel Tomasi, which was published by the OECD. There was another one done by the Asian Development Bank. But since around 2000, there's been nothing new in this field, and in the meantime, there's been a huge advance, I think, in the practices and literature on, on the subject, and we, we felt this merited a new treatment of this topic. And I think uh, one other change has been that uh, PFM has become increasingly recognized as an academic subject. It now comes into uh, Masters of Business Administration, Masters of Public, public Administration. Uh, so it's increasingly being recognized as an academic topic. Uh, with roots in economics, in public finance, in law, management science, political science, and so on. So this is another big change, I think, since in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and finally, um, and something that I think helped us to sell the idea to a number of publishing houses, from which we eventually chose Palgrave Macmillan, was the impact of the global financial crisis and the surge of in interest in strengthening the quality and performance of budgetary institutions, the increased uh, focus, as David will have a few words to say about later, on fiscal transparency issues. All that, I think, uh, was very important. <coughs> so what are the, the important features of the handbook? Uh, first of all, uh, the target audience <coughs> is, uh, is policymakers, practitioners, also academics and students of public administration and public finance, and writers and co commentators on public policy. So we had in mind when we write, wrote it a diverse audience of, of different people in different professional fields. Uh, as I say, we, we take account of uh, cutting edge research, uh, technical assistance reports and other relevant work over the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, we chose to, as authors of the, the volume, a top selection of policy makers, practitioners, and academics in the field, many of whom, although not all, have had some background in working with the uh, IMF and, and the World Bank. So it's a large volume, uh, 37 authors, 38 chapters covering most areas of PFM, 928 pages. And at times it felt like even longer than that as we were, as Richard Hemming and Barry and I were going through the editing <laughs> uh, of the various chapters, 197, nearly 200 figures, tables and boxes. So it's a, a very large uh, volume. By the way, you have a flyers, I think, uh, with you, which say a little bit more about the book. And the most important is the second page, which allows you to order the book if you are so, so interested. <laughs> Uh, the book's divided into seven parts. Uh, there's an introductory chapter, which uh, the three editors wrote. There's then a, a part looking at the institutional and legal framework for PFM, uh, focusing on the macroeconomic and fiscal frameworks, the fiscal rules, the legal frameworks, uh, and also the political economy framework for PFM. Uh, then there's sections on the, uh, basically on the, the budget cycle, uh, the, the allocation of resources, the budget preparation process and so on, managing budget execution, the next part, a part on government revenues, uh, which I think uh, makes again this volume a little bit different to some other volumes on PFM, which have tended to focus more on public expenditure, uh, a part on 
the management of assets and liabilities, and finally a part which could discuss accounting issues, reporting, transparency issues, including a chapter by David, uh, and the oversight of public finances through uh, the external audit process, uh, fiscal councils, and so on. So uh, the book covers uh, a whole range of what I'd call bread and butter issues, PFM topics such as budget classification, budget formulation, cash and debt management, internal <coughs> control, internal audit, financial accounting and reporting and so on. And also uh, a number of topics which you don't find in, in many uh, such treatments, rather more specialized topics. There's a chapter on the macroeconomic foundations of PFM, on payroll management, on extra budgetary funds, on tax design, on ma the management of external aid, a very important issue for developing countries, of course, uh, sovereign wealth funds, generational accounting, the management of state enterprises, uh, fiscal councils, and so on. So a whole range of chapters on, on more specialized topics. Um, some cross-cutting themes that are picked out in in the introductory chapter that we wrote. One I think is very important uh, is the political economy and institutional aspects of PFM. Now this wasn't really a topic on the table 10 or 15 years ago, but it's become increasingly important uh, through people like Matt Andrews at Harvard Kennedy School who've been writing uh, important material on this. So there's a lot in the book on the political economy and institutional aspects of PFM, including uh, a whole chapter by, by Paolo de Renzio and Joachim Weiner, a chapter which Philip and I which wrote on the, on the on central finance agencies, and throughout the book, this theme of institutional aspects, not just technical aspects, uh, has a lot of attention. Uh, the second one is the relationship between fiscal policy issues, fiscal strategy, the development of macroeconomic policies, the analysis of fiscal risks on which the IMF has done a huge amount of work in the last few years. The relationship between these macro, macro fiscal issues and PFM is another area that's uh, given a lot of attention in the book. There's a couple of chapters at the beginning which discuss these issues and then throughout the book uh, a lot of discussion, a chapter on fiscal risks for example. Uh, uh, is, I think, very important. The third cut cross-cutting theme is on the delivery of public services. And again, you know, one has to remember always that what is PFM about? It's about ultimately the better delivery of fiscal policies, yes, but also the better delivery of public services. So again, in the chapter dotted through the book, in the chapters on budget execution, on the chapters on budget preparation, <coughs> there's a lot of emphasis given to how these systems can be designed to deliver stronger, more effective public services. Fourth area, which has, I think, come to prominence in, in recent years <laughs> with the global crisis, is the issue of strengthening fiscal transparency and getting better accountability for for the spending of public money and use of public resources. Uh, and we have not only a chapter by David on this issue, but, the, but throughout the book, uh, there's an emphasis on the transparency of information uh, and the need for account proper accountability in the exercise of PFM systems. And the final cross-cutting theme is on making more effective use of overseas development assistance, which is a huge topic of importance for many, still for many developing countries. So this is another issue, there's a special chapter on this uh, by Bill Allen, but also through, again throughout the book, the issue of how you should uh, design uh, external aid systems to generate more effective use of these resources alongside the budget and how you can integrate overseas aid within the budget, I think is another important issue we discuss. Uh, why is it that interest in PFM has expanded so fast? I mean, when we launched the concept for this project, we were quite astonished about how many publishing companies were interested in it. 
we had about four or five, I'm, I'm not boasting about this, I'm simply stating a fact, we had about four <coughs> or five <coughs> offers to publish the book. So uh, this it raises the question of why, why this is so. I think it's, first of all, it's no longer seen as a na narrow technical subject. It's seen as something which has its roots in macroeconomic policy, uh, in the development of good fiscal strategies, in the development of good fiscal rules, which has come, come to important prominence in recent years, the allocation of resources, and also uh, microeconomic factors, the role of markets in delivering public services, the uh, effect of different incentives on, on uh, government officials to, uh, to uh, operate public financial management systems effectively, the behavioral responses of uh, officials and ministers to changes in, in, the, in, the, in the rules and regulations on, on public financial management. So this, this linked microeconomic issues has also, I think, been relevant. The growth of awareness that there's an interdisciplinary uh, nature to PFM. It's not just about economics and public finance. It's about political science, about law, about organizational theory. Uh, and, and so on. So there's, it's, it's a broad-based concept. Uh, and uh, finally, I think, as I mentioned, a uh, huge growth of interest in making governments more accountable for their decisions and more transparent in their behavior. Um, I think uh, another important change over the last 10 to 15 years, and this is something that Matt Andrews has explored a lot in his writings, is the change of the prevailing view, which was around in 2000, that there was something you could call find as good practice uh, in public financial management, which was by and large something you could transport to developing countries. Uh, so you'd look at the good practice budget preparation in, in an advanced country like the UK or, or the United States, and this is something you could replicate uh, in a developing country. I, I think that idea, which was always very simplistic, has really gone out now. And, and, the, and the increasing focus today is on what is reasonable and practical, taking account of a country's legal, administrative, and governance arrangements, and also recognition that the informal rules of behavior are often more important than the formal rules and other rules, especially in developing countries, so that you have to take account of uh, political and institutional constraints uh, in, in developing your strategies for public financial management reform. So this is a big spanner in the works of many people who like to think about PFM in very simplistic terms. And it's made it a more complicated subject, I think, to handle uh, both in advanced countries and, and developing countries. Uh, and, and something, but I think something which has to be uh, engaged with seriously in the topic. And I think also, finally, uh, uh, skepticism that some of the market-oriented solutions based on new public management principles uh, are not always the most effective ways of delivering better PFN. So uh, the best practice idea has, I think, been diluted to a large extent and been replaced by more pragmatic and country-focused solutions uh, to, uh, to the issues. Uh, and I think the old cookie cutter solutions, the idea that you could create a do it yourself manual of PFM, you just go, if you wanted to change the treasury system, you go to the relevant chapter and you follow the instructions as if you were doing a repair on your motor car. This idea has also, I think, gone out of the window, and the idea now is that there's much more, the PFM is much more complex, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, solutions can't be developed without a much deeper understanding of the issues in an individual country, the political economy environment, the institutional environment, and so it, it's a more, it becomes a more complex uh, area to, to look at. Uh, and I think uh, this leads into the implications for developing countries. Uh, through the 2000s, I think uh, the Evidence from World Bank data, from PIFA data, is that progress in improving budget institutions in developing countries has been very slow. Uh, in, in some countries, in a few countries, it's been, it's been successful, but in many countries, it has not. 
uh, and that new approaches are needed to designing PFM reform strategies. Longer time horizons are needed to implement those strategies. The very complex, grandiose PFM reform strategies are perhaps uh, not so relevant, and that the focus should be more on <coughs> more basic reforms, such as improving the credibility of the budget, uh, developing better cash management systems and accounting systems and reporting systems. We will be discussing some of these topics, I think, in other sessions during the conference tomorrow and, and, and on Thursday. But this is, I think, an, an important theme in our book, which uh, you'll find as you read through the various chapters. So I'll finish there. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>